Welcome to the International Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, April 14th, 2024. The title of this lesson and Boyd's commentary, as well as Towson's Press International Sunday School commentary is Faith of a Centurion. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. Now, before we get into our lesson, let's start with a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, be with us as we go through your word, Lord. Lord, as we go through this word, we, we pray that we are not only be hearers of the word, but also doers as we increase our faith in you. Lord, we love you, honor you, and praise you. And in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get into our lesson. Our scripture will be coming from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, and we'll be in the New King James Version of the Bible today. Now, the main thought comes from Luke chapter 7, verse 7, which says, Therefore, I didn't even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. Now, as we do each week, we'll start with a little background. We're now in the seventh lesson in the unit titled, The Measure of Faith. This week's lesson is coming once again from the book of Luke. Now, Luke was a traveling com uh, companion of Paul. He was a physician. And unlike Matthew, Mark, and, Jane, uh, and John, Luke's writing of the gospel as a historian rather than the first-hand witness like Matthew, Mark, and John. He's also believed to be the only Gentile writer of the Bible. His ex extensive writing also included the book of Acts, as we find from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. These are deliberately organized, carefully researched accounts of the events involving Jesus Christ. Now, the Gospel of Luke focused on the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Luke's Gentile perspective presented Christ as the Savior of all people, people offering both forgiveness and direction to those who follow Christ. However, Luke did not document every single act or word of Jesus Christ as there are too much material to actually record. Instead, he chose specific accounts that held an important message for the early church. See, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Luke's writings complemented the other synoptic gospels of Mark and Matthew. Mark's gospel was brief and highlighted more miracles of Jesus, while Matthew's gospel was focused on fulfilling the Old Testament Mosaic text. In contrast, Luke's gospel was known for its inclusion of all people, regardless of Jew or Gentile background, the gender or social status. It was called the gospel of compassion as it spoke directly to the marginalized and the outcasts. It's also known as the gospel of the Holy Spirit and elevated the importance of women in Jesus' ministry. As a matter of fact, Luke's, um, as a doctor, Luke's gospel came, actually had more discussions on healing miracles than the other gospel, most of which were performed for the masses of people. See, in Judea, re religious leaders um, taught that sickness, loss, and financial struggles were result results of one's sin against God. The, nat the nature of sin was um, violating the Torah, which we know is the first five books of the Bible. But in Luke, Jesus treat the masses of people as individuals whom God loved. So Luke also value and elevate again um, the, the woman in this New Testament world. And that's how we hear more about um, Mary, the mother of Christ and Mary Magdalene, along with other women. The stories that Luke had mentioned about when Jesus encountered the woman at the, uh, at the well. In doing so, we can better appreciate the radical perspective with which Jesus ministered to everyone, regardless of their social status, their creed, or their gender. Now, leading up to our lesson today, Jesus has started his ministry and began to gather people. He taught them about the Father and he healed them all along the way. 
And as Jesus performed mi miracles, many begin to hear, as we know, hearing, uh, faith comes by hearing. They begin to follow him and see him and, and actually begin to request miracles. When Jesus spoke, Everyone would listen and the crowd would thicken more and more and more and more people begin to acknowledge him as a miracle worker. Some understood that he was a son of God. Others believed he was a prophet, but all understood that he could perform things that no one else could. And this is where our lesson picks up in Luke chapter seven, verses one through five, which reads, now, when he had concluded all his sayings in the hearing of people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain satyrian servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they had come to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loved our nation and has built us a synagogue. As this text described, Jesus completed his preaching and teaching and healing that was mentioned in chapter six. Now he's heading back to Capernaum. Now Capernaum is, is, was Jesus' base camp. It was his new hometown after leaving Nazareth where he grew up. And there he was met by elders who wanted to come talk about the centurion servant that was ill and ready to die. Now, let's talk about what a centurion is. A centurion is a, a soldier who commanded a unit known as a sentry. The, it was a legion of uh, the Roman army. Now, the Roman legion ideally consisted of about 29 centurions organized in five cohorts. Oh, I'm sorry, 10 cohorts. So the elders um, noted that this centurion had an, an affection or affinity for the Jewish nation. However, we find that scholars suggest that he was not a, a convert to Judaism since he did not describe, you know, describe as a worshiper of God, but more of what, what he did for um, the Jewish people. It is possible that he appreciated the morality and the monotheism of the Jewish culture or simply the culture itself, but it does not mean that he was converted to their religion. Now, a synagogue, which they mentioned that he built for them, was a place where the Jews would gather regularly, especially on the Sabbath, to read from the scripture and discuss um, the meaning of those scriptures. We find even Jesus frequently visit the synagogue on the Sabbath to heal people, much to the displeasure of the Pharisees, of course. Therefore, mentioning that the centurion built them a synagogue, they, they were trying to say that this centurion actually endeared them. And in their mind, they deserve the help of Jesus. But note this, none of us deserve anything from God because God's blessings, his healing and his forgiving is all about his grace and favor on us through, through, our, through our faith. No one's deserving, but they're trying to make this case of uh, for this sincerian. Again, they still don't quite understand that um, it's not about works when it comes to God. And we need to understand this too. There's nothing we can do outside of recognize that is by grace through faith that we are healed. Not our works. But once we are healed, we can, uh, we, we can understand that faith without works is dead, as James said. But when we do work before um, Christ, it is meaningless. So here we find that this, this centurion, he had this unusual attitude towards his slave in this case. See, under the Roman law, a master had, to, uh, um, had the right to kill his slave. And it was actually expected that if this slave became ill or injured to the point that he could not work anymore, then they would be killed. But not this centurion. He had compassion for his, ser his servant. So instead of killing him, he heard about what, the, a man named Christ and he wanted to see if Christ could heal him. Now, in verses six through eight, this centurion shows a type of faith that actually amazed, amazed even Jesus. It read, then Jesus went with them. And when he was already, 
uh, already not far from the house, the centurion sent his friend to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. So here we find that the uh, since the group was not far from the house of the centurion, Capernaum was not that big. It didn't take more than 15, 20 minutes to get anywhere in that small town. But this man may have seen Jesus and his entourage approaching before he dispatched his his uh, delegation to meet them. So these friends may have been Gentiles or Jews or both. However, they want to greet and meet Jesus before he reached the centurion's house. So after listening to the request of the, the servant, we find that Jesus went with them. Isn't that amazing how Jesus will show up, maybe not when we want him, but always on time. When we look at this centurion, even at this point, he sent them once. As Jesus is approaching, he sent them again. It, it, the, the humility of this centurion is striking. See, he's a military commander with significant authority over the region. And the, keep in mind, the, the Romans, um, it was their land. They actually, you know, oppressed the Jewish people there. But yet he understood that as a commander with all this authority, he knew Jesus had authority as well. So though a Gentile, his respect for Jewish culture goes beyond the building of a synagogue. He assumed that no self-respecting Jewish rabbi would condescend into his home as a Gentile. See, the Censorian didn't feel worthy to speak with Jesus in, per in person which is why he initially sent the Jewish elders in the first place. His respect for Jesus and Jesus's power, it, it, it was such a way that he assumed that Jesus could heal his servant from a distance. He said, if you just say the word, this is a level of faith Jesus actually honor above any Jew that he had met so far. The Censorian's attitude is opposite that of, of Simon the Pharisees who, who showed Jesus the bare minimum of social niceties in Luke chapter 7, verse 44 through 46. But in this story of the Censorian and his faith, this is actually the second variation um, of the phrase offered we, we find in Matthew, for example. So first, Jesus states that the Censorian sent this Jewish elder to compare him to Jesus. That, that's the first time Jesus was amazed. The second time he was amazed was actually in his own hometown, where he was amazed at their unbelief. See, in verse 7 of this gospel, the Censorian uh, addresses Jesus as Lord through his friends. However, we should not assume that this means that, that this uh, satirian actually acknowledged Jesus as Lord God. See, the Greek word Lord actually appears over 700 times in the New Testament and is often used as a polite address uh, of respect. It's almost like the modern day use of sir, so to speak. So we shouldn't read too much into him calling Jesus Lord here. However, there, there's two things worth considering about this Assyrian's message. First, we understand that his humility as he admits that he is unworthy. And second, some Bible scholars suggest that in addition to his acknowledging his personal unworthiness, this is in also being sensitive to the potential cultural differences that makes um, this cross-cultural meeting with a Gentile under the, his own roof a little awkward. So he sent them out to meet Jesus. So when Jesus approached this house, the Caesarean friends came and spoke with him and, and, and they followed the Caesarean's direction. So 
The Caesarean uh, assumed that Jesus uh, would follow the same path as himself when it comes to leadership. Jesus represents God and he does what God tells him to do. And Jesus mentioned this over and over, right? Jesus had the authority to heal many people of their illnesses. The Caesarean servants did not need to be present to even ensure that the job gets done. He doesn't have to be present to ensure, and this is Syrian this time, he, he doesn't have to be present to ensure that his um, soldiers get the job done. So he understood that Jesus don't need to be present to heal his servant as well. Therefore, there's no reason to think that Jesus had to be present to carry out the will of the Father. Now, we find here, however, that it's not entirely clear what this that this uh, centurion understood all about Jesus' power. See, he he understand that he, he that Jesus had power because he's heard about him hearing uh, healing people, as we find in verse one. He understood this, but we can't assume that he he understand that Jesus is all powerful and all God and all he, uh, and all human at the same time. But he respected Christ and his healing ability. He respected Jewish culture and their religion. But we find as we get to verse eight. The, that that with this understanding of the authority that he understand all Jesus need to do is issue the order and that order will be obeyed. Thus, the, Caesarea, the centurion here understood that all he got to do is send his, his, his people on a mission and they will complete the mission the way that it need to be done. But unlike this centurion who had authority over soldiers, Jesus had unlimited authority over the world. Regardless of how we perceive this centurion's word, they emphasize Jesus' authority over all things, including sickness. See, there's no indication that he understand that Jesus is God and Jesus is a Jewish Messiah, but he believed that Jesus is empowered by the Jewish God to do these things. If this is the case, then Jesus is undoubtedly holy and the Jewish God can do whatever he wants. This is so important of how he had this faith that Jesus can do it and he don't even have to be there to do it. When we call upon his name right now, we need to have that understanding that though sometimes he may not be near Jesus, all he have to do is say a word for us to be healed. Now, in our final verses, verses nine and 10, we find that Jesus shows up and he shows out. It reads, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd, um, followed him, I say to you that I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. It says, Jesus was amazed by the message that he received from this Roman centurion, which demonstrated a deep faith in Jesus work and his authority. See, on hearing this message, the Bible say Jesus was astonished. He was so astonished that he had to address the crowd and let them know. He said, I have not even seen this faith such great in Israel, where, where God's people lived, where, where the ones chosen by God, where the, the ones that rejected people. He was, Jesus was rejected by the Jewish leadership. While this Gentile showed remarkable faith. The centurion had a better understanding of Christ's ministry, his mission, and his authority over sickness and death than those of the Jews. Who, who should have recognized that Jesus is the promised Messiah. They had the Old Testament. They had the prophecies about Christ, yet they didn't believe. But the centurion's faith was characterized by this deep humility, this strong faith, and this simple confidence in Christ. These are the qualities that's essential to any believer. Now, it's important to note that Jesus was not amazed by the centurion's generosity or the compassion that he had towards his slave, but rather by the simplicity and the strength of his faith. 
The centurion understood Jesus' authority and sovereignty over the spiritual realm, which was unprecedented. Now, here's the question I have for you. Could Jesus say the same about your faith? Would Jesus be amazed by your faith? Because if that's not the case, then the Bible tells us we can pray and ask for more faith because we have even more evidence than the centurion did back then or the Jews in reading the Old Testament to know that Jesus is real and we can put all of our faith in him to the point that he should be amazed. Now, there are only a few recorded instances where we read where Jesus was amazed or astonished. He was amazed in our story today at the faith of, of the centurion who stands in stark contrast of the amazement that Jesus had in the disbelief of the Jews in his own hometown of Nazareth. The, the, the one showing great faith in the spoken word of Christ and his supreme, uh, his supreme authority over nature and the world and over sickness. And on the other hand, is dem- uh, he was amazed at the demonstration of such lack of faith that he, uh, the people had in Nazareth. So much so that he, he was prevented from performing mighty miracles in Nazareth except laying his hands on sick people and healing him. See, we need to understand this. Our God is a God who hears and answers prayers. Nevertheless, to say that when those were, were, that when they were sent and returned back to the house, they found that the slave was in good health. However, we need to understand and we need to remember that God does not always answer our prayers for healing at the time we expect or in the way that we would like sometime. Sometime our healing may be delayed or even be withheld to bolster our faith. The key part here is we need to hold on to God. Regardless of the situation, because we found that God's answer to our prayers is yes and amen. Meaning that if even if we are not healed in this life, we will be spent eternity with him um, with all healing, lacking nothing. So our faith must be of a faith even stronger than this sincere centurion soldier. We must have faith in our Lord that he will do what he say he would do, even when all else seemed unlikely. Amen. Brothers and sisters, until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. I'm Minister Adam, and you have a blessed week.